we have a few people that are coming in now. So I'm going to invite a few others so that we have a sizable audience before we, we, we start the conversation. Cynthia, that's good. I can see we are live on all the platforms. I haven't seen the Twitter space yet on your. On you have not. Uh, should I send you the link on your on your WhatsApp and you join with the link? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have sent it. Um, check uh, if you got it on on your WhatsApp. Jendo, your WhatsApp is not on. Can I? Let me also send it to your DM on. on uh, uh, let me check. Let me check. Uh, It's now connected. Okay, so you should you should get it in a in a second. Okay, just let me send it on your on your DM on Twitter. Because no. I can see have not yet seen it on WhatsApp. Let me send it in your messages on Twitter. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I have sent it. You've joined. Come again. I have sent it on your on your Twitter in the messages. Um if your if your internet is connected on your phone, you should all oh, fill up to you should be able to see it. Can you see it now? The link? Not yet. Um, what could be the problem? Um, are you able to see it now on Ada? Check WhatsApp again and see. Not yet on WhatsApp, but let me go back to see. So well, what you do, just uh, uh, go to my page on Twitter. It should be able to bring you right into the space. Because so many others have joined without the invite. If if the okay. message doesn't come, try that and 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 listen. Hi guys. 
Uh, thank you for being here. We are waiting for General Mundo to join us and, and we start. Um, please invite some more people to, to join the conversation. So we are waiting for, for, for General Mundo himself and, and some more other people before we, we get it started. Yep, I think I'm getting there. It should be correct. Jenna, did you see it? Yeah, I'm joining this place now. Okay. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. Is Paul still in the bedroom in that meeting? I wanted to use the bedroom. What are you doing? Ah, okay. Where are you talking about? From this place? No, from this place. Oh. There's no internet that side. I'm saying there's a problem. Okay, let me stay here. There's a lot of work going to this place. Ah, yes. So, so, I can see you now. I don't know if we should start. Is Cynthia ready? Should we start? Yes, you can start. Okay. I got to remember to allow Jeno to, uh, to, to speak on, on his microphone. On the spaces, on the spaces. Yes. Okay. So, so yeah, you're already in general. Oh, you've sent a request to speak, eh? Because the moment you um, start, then you'd have to be picking me. Okay. Um, I don't know why we are still very low on uh the audience here, yeah. so maybe we just ignore the Twitter audience. No, we just start, start, we just start with the rest. Okay, okay. Hello, good evening uh, for all those listening and watching us. We are on uh, Twitter, on uh, YouTube, and, and on uh, Facebook. Um, we are having General Mugisha Mundu, a leader of the Alliance for National Transformation, a former presidential candidate, and um, former army commander and so many other things, but he will talk about what is uh, relevant to this meeting when we bring him on. Um, what we will we'll do is we'll engage him on uh, the topical issues to get his take and uh, the ANG's take on, on issues arising. And, and then we will be accepting questions from um, those with us. Um, if you can send the questions to my uh, DM or WhatsApp, whoever uh, accesses my WhatsApp, then we'll get the general to, to respond to the questions. But for now, I'm going to first invite him to, to greet you and, um, and say hello, and then we, we go right into the conversation. Then you're most welcome. Um, Thank you, Agatha. Your, Good afternoon. Uh, hold on, Jenna, let me first uh, get your microphone on, um, on yeah, so you can go right ahead. Good afternoon, Agatha. Thank you for hosting me. I'd like to thank all the Ugandans in the, the country, as well as those in the diaspora, who will be able to join us on the different platforms. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeno. Thank you very much. Um, we, I, we will start with uh, the massacre killings and uh, we will ask you to, to talk to us about as someone who has been in the security 
arena of this country before, we would like to have your take on what is going on in Masaka, where about 30 people have been killed so far, and the 70 arrests that have been so far made. What, what do you make of the security situation in that part of the country, and, and what should be done to, to stop it? It's unfortunate for the families that lost their dear ones. The massacre situation is not new. I think it's a repeat of what has happened about two or three times before. And at times it happens in different parts of the country. There's a conversation going on all over the country because when you get about 30 people you know, killed within the same sub-region, within a span of two months. That's quite uh, frightening. It creates a lot of anxiety. There has been a, a focus from the regime as a, I suppose, a knee-jerk reaction because that's no matter what happened. And, and as we've experienced before, when the concentration of resources, human as well as the financial and logistical in a particular area, naturally they'll be able to stamp out or uh, so we, have a, don't know, we have a problem on Twitter. I think you have gone off on Twitter. I don't know what has happened. Okay. Yes, um, can you please check again? Drive join the Twitter spaces and it's connecting. Okay, let me be engaging the guys here that um, that want to, to say something and they see what they're saying. Try to, to I, reconnect. I have rejoined, I have rejoined the Twitter space. Mm, no, not yet. I cannot I see you on the sent you a request for voice. Okay, this is, uh, it hasn't, I think it's my network on the phone that is delaying because I have not yet got it. Oh uh, yeah, that's, I think there's a connection problem. I'll try to rejoin it again. Yeah, I, I think I think it's my connection that that has uh, it's connected again. I'm sending a yeah. request again. I think I'll be explaining some of the colleagues on the other platforms before the conversation and build that link works. We can, can we ignore our Twitter in the meantime? I believe it will be cultural for people are trying to fix it. Okay. Okay, so we continue with the conversation as... Um... Yeah, as uh, yeah. Twitter spaces and the links. Now there is a problem. Um, well, it seems I have to, to start the spaces again because uh, my, my internet is the one that had gone off. Okay. Yes, um, so try to join again. Had you used the, the, the invite, the link I sent you? Yeah. So let me send you another one. Uh, should I send it on WhatsApp? Send it on the Twitter. Okay. Yes, I have sent it.
have you got it? Oh, hi. Uh, sorry, I think we, we had got a connection problem here, but um, we are trying to reconnect and we are waiting for General to, to reconnect because I had to start a new spaces. Please bear with us. So General is uh, back on. Um, We can go right ahead with the discussion. We had started with, um, with the issues of um, massacre, massacre, the massacre killing. General, go right ahead, please. So I was saying that with the concentration of effort by the regime in massacre, uh, financial or discourse as well as human, I suspect that they'll be able to stabilize the situation for a short while. The biggest problem we've always had, whenever there are such spikes in the different parts of the country, is that uh, when there is a stable situation, either because the countries have been arrested or because they have been uh, terrified by the presence of the security service in the area and they go underground. When the situation stabilizes and the uh, security op op uh, managers go to sleep after stability is acquired, there is a recurrence. And until the regime focuses on investing long term in the uh, state security apparatus that uh, deals with the uh, protection of uh, individuals and uh, property, that is in the police services and more so the criminal investigation department, if they don't invest in that and invest in uh, the prosecutions department and invest in the court system so that they are able to close the circuit because it cracked down on crime in the medium long term is to ensure that you create systems where people who don't want to commit crime know for sure that there is no way you can commit any crime and you're not found out, investigated and successfully prosecuted, and you're going to serve the life sentences that are within the law. That becomes a deterrent. But it cannot happen until all those three departments are fully staffed and the staff are motivated, they are fully equipped, and they are also uh, operating on uh, an understanding that their main purpose for being those departments is specifically to deliver the service for which they are recruited to do. If all that is not done, we're just going to be you know, having knee-jerk reactions all the time. Because of recent, I just had some killings which have happened, I think is it in Nakaseke or someplace, as has happened in many parts of the country. I noticed the responses by the regime, like happened last time. I've seen on the social media, some young people in Masaka sub-region, whom, whom General Kale, when he was still the IGP, paraded for cameras, and I understand they were promised money, or, or you know, they are complaining that they never were given the money. But this time around, I've heard that they are giving uh, the families of those who are killed some amounts of money, 10 million or something like that. The question is, will you be able to pay all the families whose uh, uh, ones are killed all over the country? It's just uh, a diversionary thing, and it just simply can't work. They need to channel money into the state security apparatus that deals with the uh, crime, and not spend more money in the departments that ensure regime uh, um, survive. I think that's where the biggest problem is. Okay, thank you. Thank you, General. But uh, the question that I would like you to address, I don't know if it would be speculative or not, is before we go to investing and equipping the court system, the prosecution and the investigators, what can be done or what could be the reason that we are seeing these killings now and uh, have spanned over a period of about six weeks? Um, are there any ideas, any guesses that uh, this could be the problem? It's, I, you know, it's, it's surprising to me that actually the levels of crime are that low, considering the environment in which we are operating, considering the environment in which the, the joblessness, the level of joblessness is quite high, 
the many young people who are seeking for jobs, which they aren't getting. The levels of poverty are quite deep. The moral fabric of our society has literally been thrown into shreds. And, and in an environment like that, you would expect that there would be crime in any country that you'd go to. So that the levels of crime, even where they, they still are, is just uh, more of, of luck, I think, than, than, than anything else. So in, in the, in the, in the, there are things which can be done short term, like uh, uh, channeling the resources to departments which deal with that. That's something that is doable. That's something that they can do. Because if you motivate staff, if you ensure that, for example, CID department has got adequate resources and motivated staff, they can still operate. I saw some statistics uh, a while back where they are projection in terms of the request for, for resources in solving cases were around uh, 100,000, I think 111,000, the cases that they would project be dealing with in the whole country for a year. And uh, of those 40,000 were serious crime. But the current uh, activ activities that they conduct, they're only able to deal with uh, 11, about 11, between 11 to 15,000 uh, uh, cases. And, and it's understandable, because if the budget that they do have cannot enable a, a police officer in the CID department, in a district, to sustain or remove uh, carrying out investigation, more than two weeks in a month, how on earth do you expect them to do their job? How do you expect them to do their jobs if the department is understaffed and, and, and ill-motivated? That, 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 that's, that's inevitably what leads to the continuation of these kinds of crime, you know? Two, recruitment itself, because in, like in the CID department, CID department needs to have the best of the police officers in any, in any police force that is, that is uh, uh, professional and that is uh, positioned to respond to the needs of, uh, of the population. Because uh, uh, security of persons and property is one of the core elements that any responsible government should be uh, dealing with. So right from the point of recruitment, and of course, uh, uh, training and motivation and the political environment in itself. Because if a police officer is getting about 300,000 shillings or 400,000 shillings or 500,000 shillings at the different uh, lower ranks, and they see senior uh, political leaders stealing money in billions, how on, on earth do you think that they would feel motivated to deal with cases? They just be there physically, but in their minds, I don't think that they'll be doing all that they protect to do things to protect the population. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a dilemma. Uh, okay, General. So what, what do you make of the arrests that have been made? 70 people arrested, over 70 now, including uh, members of parliament. And, and then when, when it comes into the fact that we have we, we sort of have predetermined positions from the president and the politicians before even investigations are made because we've had the president say politicians, we've had uh, the minister for information, Chris Bayomo, previously say that opposition politicians. So what do we make of these arrests that have been, been made of so many people and the comments that have also been made before? First, the response by a number of senior government officials, including the president himself and some of the ministers, uh, uh, unfortunately blamed the opposition. It's the usual scapegoat. Every time they have a problem that they have no immediate solution to, they always scapegoat. They, they scapegoat is not, not, not on about the opposition. If it's not the opposition, it is uh, foreign forces. If it's not foreign forces, it's all kinds of things that they keep saying. I mean. I've even seen General Seven at some point saying that the police force itself is so full of weevils, as you are saying. So uh, when you have a regime that has got senior leaders who don't accept you know, responsibility, it's one of the biggest challenges that you find in, the, in the political government or in any other form of government. But the first uh, step of solving any problem is to recognize 
that uh, the solutions you try to offer are not working. At the moment you recognize that there is a serious challenge, then you go back on the drawing board, and then you redesign, and you put uh, forward uh, another solution. But if you are operating from a mind where you're always looking for skeptics, where you don't accept the responsibility, it becomes very, very difficult to put into place measures for uh, short, medium, and long-term solutions to, to different uh, challenges. Okay, Jono, um, I think before we leave this uh, topic, I, I will be taking in uh, questions per topic before we go to... So and, and, and before then, you asked about the different people who were arrested, the many people who were arrested. That's not the first time. I mean, I, I know, like, for example, when Jono Kari was still the IGP, uh, we, uh, if, if I recall correctly, we must have had about two, three, four, five, or six media appearances of people who had been arrested for different uh, serious crimes. And, and a number of them would even uh, confess. But I have not heard of uh, successful prosecutions and trials and, and, and sentencing of those culprits. They remain in prison for a short while. And when uh, uh, the situation has cleared, six months maybe down the road, or one year, they are released. They go back into uh, the public as well or, or, or they were real, uh, uh, they are the ones who have committed the crime is also a totally different matter. Because if you don't have good investigative services, many people fall victim because of the panic of the security services. Some of them do things at times the extreme simply to give an impression to the commander in chief that they are doing work because most of them don't do things work professionally, they just want to survive as well. Just as the government wants to survive, the, 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 the afflictions that uh, have compromised the regime in their thinking also afflict those who are blocked. Because if the regime is working just for survival, even those blocked, it will take you. And they also do their work you know, looking for survival, not to follow, like in the particular case of carrying out investigation. To, to, even if it takes you a month or two months or three months or six months, how long it takes you, to show that you get the right carpet. That you don't just go round up people just because you want to create an impression either to the public or to the appointing authority. That's unfortunate because you can imagine people who are rounded up for innocent. And you spend six months, six months, one year in prison just because of the weaknesses within the system. Uh, yes, I, I, I hear you, General, and, and that, that was my next question, that what does that, the rounding up of people that we've seen in so many cases now, including the, the current uh, killings in massacre, so the rounding up of people, what does, it, uh, what does it mean for the credibility of the justice system, of the police that arrests so many times, and in the end, um, there's no prosecution to the, to the conclusion of the case. At the end of it all, the only solution is going to be, again, as I indicated earlier on, investment in the, in the security services, in the police, in CID. Because, you know, like in CID in the past, they used to have uh, sleeping agents or, or agents embedded in, the, in the areas where there would be crime. And, it, and, and they would never be known, you know. They, had, they were very well trained. And even if it took six months or one year, eventually they'll be able to get the person who committed the crime. That whole system is totally being dismantled. Now, of course, CID has got part of, uh, I think, intelligence. And that, that intelligence uh, arm seems to concentrate more on political intelligence than on uh, getting uh, information about crime. So we still are going to face this challenge for quite a while. My own belief and understanding is that until there is a, a new group of people who will be able to offer it different, I doubt whether this regime is going to offer medium long term solution. Then they can offer short term, like in terms of responding by focusing resources, human, logistical, and financial in an area where there is a spike. They have the capability to stamp it out as has happened before, but it is always, it will always resurface. And of course, they have to invest money into the justice system, in the prosecution department, in the, in the, in the courts, 
And we have, we have one of the biggest frightening aspects within our society. Because while you could uh, keep a blind eye when politicians become corrupt or politicians uh, do things the wrong way, the, the, the ultimate, the, the justice system, those, those uh, Ugandans who opt to go into training, become lawyers, eventually become magistrates and justice. A court is the ultimate area where every citizen should feel secure. It should be the last bastion in any society that should resist any compromise. Because when that happens, when there is justice in a society, you can afford to make compromises in all other areas. But when the judicial service system itself becomes infiltrated and is brought down to its knees, then that society is basically you know, in a state of peril. Right now, I think we are at that point. Because you hear what is happening. Okay, we normally never want to talk about uh, judges and magistrates in the public. But those who are managing the court system need to get a, a retreat and reconsider. Those who sit in those chairs of justice, the magistrates, the judges, need to think. Then they should not go the way the rest of us have gone. Because that's a sacred area of, 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 of human existence. If they don't understand that, they are sick. Uh, well, General, that's, uh, that's uh, rather unfortunate. Um, I was thinking of us continuing this topic and getting questions from the audience about it. But I, I think it's better we just uh, finish the conversation and then um, as I take note of the questions that are coming in. So um, I think my other question would be about the continued closure of schools. Uh, children have been out of schools for the last uh, maybe 18 months or thereabouts. And uh, I would like to know what do you think that means for the future of our children and the problems that come with it and also what would be the ANT's position had it been in power and facing the situation as it is now of, of COVID-19 vis-a-vis children rusting away and, and, and you know, facing these other uh, existential threats as a result of idleness and stuff. What would, would you do or what would the ANT do in the situation we find ourselves in regarding the continued closure of schools? Unfortunately, COVID has ravaged the whole world. And uh, governments have really found it very difficult to cope in different ways. And it's understandable. However, even when there, is a, uh, when there are challenges, like in this regard, the manner in which COVID has devastated countries, any government that is filled uh, with leaders who care have got to look for solutions, however difficult situations might be. Two, leaders need to learn from others. But well, there is no country which has not been affected by COVID. And there are others which are, who have advanced, who have progressed, who have gone beyond others. For example, there are countries which have now gone through the third wave. So any country that would have come from the first wave would have met with a number of things that they would never have anticipated and maybe they would not have were handled. But when you find that there are countries that have gone through the second, third wave, then you learn from, I think the, the question of opening educational institutions. We, we are not an island. Kenya has been hit, Tanzania has been hit. Uganda needs to study, to learn from them. And that's what we, as the ANT, in the proposals we were giving because uh, we gave a number of proposals to government. And, and unfortunately, they made one step, I think a week or two ago, where they had a Zoom conference with the uh, various uh, uh, actors within the educational institution, which was a good step forward. My hope, or our hope would have been that they would learn from all experts and work out ways of how they can reopen the school. 
and not just to depend on what I saw General Seven say, that until the whole country, the 22 million Ugandans are vaccinated, that they will not allow children to go back to school. On the, on the understanding that uh, the number of schools are day schools, the majority of them, and that the children will be at risk. And when they go home, they will reinfect the, 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 the parents. That doesn't make sense. Because even when they stay at home, the parents go to town, they go to markets, they go to shops, they go through the public transport systems, which means that they, the moment they're also infected, they also infect the, the students. It doesn't make sense. And two, vaccination, we don't know right now because the government is not coming out with a plan, which we ask them to do as a, as, as a and that they need to give us a clear plan. By when do they expect that the vaccination would be done effectively or fully on the 22 million Ugandans that they intend to vaccinate? Do they have the money in place? Do they have the vaccines? And what about the infrastructure of carrying out such a uh, vast exercise? Because we have seen countries that have got the means, a number of them have not completed uh, vaccinating the, their populations. And it's already seven, eight, nine months, some of them close to a year since they started the vaccination. So which would lead us to assume that in Uganda, it may take a year or plus. So which basically means that if they are going to depend on vaccination as the uh, basis on reopening schools, that means we'll be having schools still shut for one year. You might think about a huge number of young people, a generation that is being affected by this. And, and, and two, because of lack of plans of the regime, not being able to do what is necessary for them to be uh, released to go back to schools, but with a clear plan, because they must uh, do testings of, of, of teachers, they must do testings of uh, students, they must invest all the money that is necessary to monitor, to see the slightest uh, indication of any increase in infections and move in and stamp it out. There are, there are experts that will be able to give all the nature of advice that is necessary and to plus the countries which have done the same, like Kenya, like Tanzania, and they'll be able to learn from them. And apply what works, this kind. Okay, so, so General, my next question would also sound like it requires a speculative answer, but it, it beats our understanding that uh, Uganda, which has not been um, the worst affected by COVID, for example, both in the region and is the one that is not opening schools because a, a UNICEF report put Uganda among the top 20, I mean, countries with the highest number of closure, number of days of closure of schools. It could be number one now because that report did not, was, was I think a few months ago. Why do you think the government continues to insist on, on closing schools knowing that the dangers that are coming with that. I'm not so sure that I know exactly their motivation, but I can only try to uh, read the, through uh, study over a long time the character of the regime, and uh, that uh, the, the character that causes them to do the number of things which are unexplainable to a rational human being. One, that is a lack of care many, many times. As, as long as they are taking care of themselves, they never seem to care about uh, other people. Two, there also seems to be uh, a tendency of corruption that seems to influence the manner in which some of these uh, uh, programs are, are, are run. There's a lot of debate. I don't think it has been exhausted enough for us to reach a clear conclusion. But when you look at what happened in the health sector, maybe the same influence in the school system. Because beyond the students, you also see a number of uh, private schools which are really in a bad shape. Many of the domestic investors, because I think that's where, they, where many are, are screaming their heads off, trying to look for relief where the government would work with banks to restructure loans. Now again, we hear that there are schools which are not being sold on the cheap. So who knows, maybe some of these uh, political decision makers are, are hoping that 
the, 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 those who have been in the private investments in schools can be squeezed to a point where they sell off their properties and they buy them on the cheap. That also could be a possibility. Because I don't see any other rational reason. Because you can't tell me that children at home are better protected now. Because all of us are moving in town, we are going through social, I mean, uh, public transportation system, we are going to markets, we are going all over the place, and the parents go back home. So if the parents who have gone to town get infected, basically the kids at home will be infected. So, there are things which is simply you can't even make sense of with, with this regime. The same thing with churches. Churches, most are still shut down. I've attended burials within the last uh, several one month or so, and, and uh, the people are there in thousands. I mean, in, <laughs> in churches and mosques, if the if department in government concerned with those religious institutions who are to work with them like they did last time, they'll be able to reopen. But they have got their own agendas. They're those are in government. Unfortunately, even those religious institutions are headed by people who seem also to play safe. Because I wouldn't see any reason why they wouldn't mount all the pressure that is necessary for churches and must be reopened. Again, the, the very uh, ailment that affects those who are in power seems to have afflicted even those who head those religious institutions. As so, so general now now that you actually talk about churches as well, we saw at the burial of General Rokech the, 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 the crowd that, that gathered. And uh, I think I, I would like you to, to help us understand how that makes Ugandans feel who are locked up at home, whose children cannot go to school, who cannot congregate to in places of worship, like you're saying. What can be done in in a, in a situation like that, and and what how are we supposed to get confidence as Ugandans that this the measures being taken to curb the, the spread of the virus? It's basically, it's not that the burial of General Kech alone. There have been many burials of civilians of different people, some that have attended, others that you get through social media, and and the numbers you know, in the rural area, the numbers are big. So that, that's a not, that's a not an area that the government is paying attention to. The government, for some strange reason, and I hope eventually the real reasons will surface, is now still focused on three areas. One, the religious institution, churches and mosques. Two, schools. Three, political activity. And you, you can't even rule it out that they are concentrating on the schools and the religious institutions so simply to forestall the opening of political space. But the moment they open church and mosques and then the schools, then the politicians also be up saying, okay, now it's a step for people to congregate in political meetings. When you are dealing with people whose only care on earth is how to survive and, and spend all their lives in you know, soft life, stealing, looting, and not caring about anything else, that's certainly is bound to happen. And I don't think that they really care about trust of the population, like you are saying. I don't think they care about that anymore, because you can really understand that the basis of their uh, still into power is, is force and manipulation through use of money and the spreading of fear. So I don't think that they want to do things to earn themselves trust with the population. That's something that was lost quite a while back. Okay, General, thank you very much. We have uh, so many people watching and following, and most of them on the Twitter spaces. We would like to bring them into the conversation and um, they ask you the questions they want to ask. I'll start by those that sent questions to me and um, cause them to you here. Uh, I think the first question was about Steve Vijambia in Masaka. It is from Krisa Himsiwe, and uh, he's asking what you think the solution is to the Rijambia people that seem to have defe defeated the combined force of police, as well as the professionalized army. And why is there a swift, the, why is the force swift at blocking political groups 
political rallies, but not providing security when there is insecurity, and especially in this case of uh, the Jambia in Masaka. I think in my earlier, uh, when we were having the conversation earlier on, I more or less uh, talked about those two issues. But one, the medium long term solution is to invest uh, in police, in the uh, prosecution department and the uh, judiciary. So there is a complete circuit where there is motivation of staff, of first uh, recruitment of the best that are within our society into those uh, three departments, training them motivating them and equipping them. The moment that is done, then you would have offered long-term solutions to whatever situation emerges anywhere within this country. The short-term solution, as they are trying to do, is uh, to focus uh, resources, human, financial, and logistical in an area. And, 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 and I believe they will be able to uh, stamp it out in a short time because uh, the countries, at times, they may be arrested. At times, because of the, the concentration of, of effort and force in an area, they will go underground. So for a while, there will be a reprieve to the community within that area. But suppose it erupts in a different subregion. You know, then you keep on a vicious cycle. There is a spike, and then there are media reaction. Then there is immediate uh, response by concentrating resources. And then the, 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 the situation is the, you know, stamped out. And then they, they go to sleep. And then the, the criminals resurface again. You keep in that vicious cycle. We have seen this cycle the last 10 years, I don't know how many times, in the different parts of the country. Yeah, and then the politics, you know, this, this regime of fears, population that is conscious, that is aware, that is organized. So we will still keep looking at them, trying to manipulate all, using all measures to manipulate the political situation. But Ugandans, we need to know that uh, this is our country, you know. And uh, in, in, in life, you don't get what you deserve. <laughs> you get what you, you know, negotiate. So Ugandans need to know that you must get better and better organized, to remain resilient, not to be fearful, not to give up hope. Because we are, you know, this is our country. Actually, the, 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 the honest men and women should be the ones doing more than ever. Because you can imagine when you are honest, and then you are the one who is underground, you are in fear, living in fear. And all these people who still are the ones, you know, moving around <laughs> with their high heads high, as if they are the ones who are in the right. It should be the other way around. This country, the culture is upside down. The, the, the thieves should be the ones who are fearful. The honest men and women should be the ones who are walking with their heads up high. It's the other way around, and, and unfortunately, Men and women who are honest seem to be living in fear. And the ones who are you know, criminals are the ones creating the fear. <laughs> that needs to be shifted. You know, it must be our responsibility as Ugandans who have integrity, who are honest men and women, who do their jobs wherever they are in business, in agriculture, in the services, in trade, wherever anybody is, and they're earning their money and spending it, uh, you know. To according to their needs, they are not stealing government, and then you find these people who are stealing are the ones who are riding rough. That's absolute. That should be absolutely unacceptable. You know, <laughs> being slaved in your own country. You know, someone using the state security apparatus, which should be serving at the pleasure of the citizen, the taxpayer. Because any general in the army, any inspector general of police and the other police officers, anybody in intelligence, anybody in the cabinet, needs to know that they are paid by the taxpayer. That should be the status. It hasn't happened. But that's what every government must fight for. Because if before we achieve that, then just uh, know that you just give us slaves. You may, you may just uh, think that you are free, but that's delusional. As if you are paying tax and living in fear. But because of someone whom you are paying and is causing fear to you, then you know you are a slave. You are not a free man, a woman. Know that. That's the reality. So the question is how do you work on that? Change the status. So tomorrow the thief is the one who is in hiding. 
And you who is paying taxes and you are a responsible citizen needs to live in freedom. Anybody who doesn't understand that is living in delusion. But how, how do we change the status, Jim? Uh, you know, we have seen that uh, even in elections where maybe Ugandans would want to change the status, have not yielded those results. The question we should ask ourselves is that the question we need to ask ourselves all the time is how do the people who live as free citizens in their own countries, how did they reach that point? But there's no society which jumped from one point to another without struggle. Because it, it's resolved. That's where you start from. Focusing on what you want and be resolved to get it at any cost. It takes sacrifices. But in a society that fears sacrifice, we live as, as the, 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 the men and women in that society will live as slaves. Uh, unfortunately, that must be recognized. Two, if, if all the instruments of fear that are used, and they have been used since uh, the beginning of, uh, of creation. If people who are oppressed never were resolved and never were purposeful in achieving their freedoms, then we, should, we would still be living in medieval time. But we are not. Because of the resolve and, and, and the focus of people who have always wanted to live as free men and women in their own countries, that's why society progresses. So when you find generations in any country of people who are fearful, <laughs> then you know that the problem is not anywhere else but within them. Um, thank you, thank you, General. And uh, for our listeners and viewers and following from uh, all our platforms right now, I am reminding you that you can ask general question that you want to ask. Send it to me on uh, DM. I think DM on Twitter is much better so that I don't have to juggle, go through the platforms looking for the question. Now, General, I'm going to go to a question that I received earlier from uh, Frederick Golova Mutebi. And uh, he asks, what, what are the key constraints to building functioning policy-focused political parties in Uganda? And can those constraints be overcome under current circumstances? The, the first constraint, really one, the, the, the environment itself created by those who are in power, creating a restrictive environment in which uh, citizens can organize. However, to me, I wouldn't see that as the as a only problem because since creation, human beings have wanted to use power to oppress others. So that's always been a given until society advances to a level where there's a critical number of men and women who say we cannot be trampled upon because we pay taxes and we must be able to determine the manner in which those taxes are used. That's the whole purpose of government. That's how government evolved. That's how systems have changed from feudalism to, to uh, the current state where we are, where they are democracies. The people who pay taxes say, we must have a voice now our taxes are used. But having said that, there's also a responsibility of the citizens who pay taxes to be that that they want to see happen. <laughs> As Gandhi said, Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see happen. Now, scan around the African continent because of the kind of situation we have is not only here in Iran. Look, there is a kind of, uh, I don't know whether it's in a, a misunderstanding or what it is exactly. You can't have democracy without democracy. You cannot have uh, a transformative agenda in any country without having transformative leaders at different levels. So one of the things that any organized group that wants to uh, succeed and change the nature of uh, the political environment in a country is you start by creating the bricks because brick by brick you build. So if you want to uh, uh, build democracy and systems of good governance, transparency, justice. Then you start creating the bricks. You start creating, either recruiting those who are already formed, who are Democrats by conviction, or who are 
change agents by conviction, not by words. The Americans say, uh, uh, talk is cheap. Anybody can say that all of us as politicians are always all over the place, radio, TVs, rallies, wherever. We, we say all things that you hear spoken about all over the world, about good governance, about justice, about transparency. But the question is, is there a consistency between what we say and what we do? So any successful organization would have to go down and, and either recruit those who are already formed, who have the convictions, or recruit those who are uh, aligned to that thinking and, and, and work in terms of uh, building them through all manner of, uh, of actions that are needed, through mentorship, through training consistently and organizing, and also if there's a number of leaders who have gone through experiences being the leaders, you know, by example. And then once you build that critical mass, then you can build the parties which are democratic, which have got transparency in terms of how they manage the resources, their own as well as when they get into the country, having the, uh, transparency in the systems of management, having the justice, being fair in the manner in which they deal with people, caring also, you know, if you don't have them, everything will remain on, on, on simpler talk. <laughs> I had thought that we had seen the last of coups on this continent. <laughs> I was shocked a few days after to see a coup in Guinea. You know, but there have been politicians in Guinea, but they must have mishandled the political situation, you know, in Guinea. And now the army intervenes. The army itself is not a democratic institution. So whatever those uh, uh, Generals may be saying, I doubt whether they will be able to fulfill even the, the intentions that they expressed right now. So we cannot have shortcuts. Democracy is an end state. Justice, fairness, good governance is an end state. But there must be people who are resilient, who are believers in those uh, ideas, and are able to fold their, you know, their sleeves. And, and do the, 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 the heavy lifting until we reach that end state. The problem we have is that we have got, uh, again, in the African countries, more so like in Uganda, where we have uh, experience. We have a population, one, of, of peasants who are the majority, and, and their main focus is really not on the ideas we talk about. Their main focus is on, on, on bread and butter issues. So they're easily manipulated. In the elite, no matter who give leadership in any change situation, they, they are, they, they, there, is, there is divided attention. They are also the elite who are looking for survival. So they're able to compromise the ideas as long as they can survive, as long as they can be part of the looting process in government. So therefore the elite who uh, believe in democracy, who believe in transparency and good governance uh, uh, ideas need to collaborate come together, organize, be resilient, and keep fighting until they, they cause the shift in the balance of force. There are no shortcuts to that. Thank you, General. Uh, uh, before I go back to the second question of Dr. Goroba, which I, I would actually like to ask about uh, where you ended, that there are no shortcuts. How do you reconcile how do you strike a balance between telling Ugandans that there are no shortcuts, that there's a long route that they need to run, and between that and, and the urgency, the sense of urgency that some Ugandans have of, of we need change yesterday. And, and, and also connected to it is the change seek, mobilizing the change seekers and the incremental change you, you speak of. I'd like to, you to tell us how the AMT has fared so far in building these bricks that will, that, that implement change? One, one, there are two different aspects in that question, but to us in Alliance for National Transformation, they are interlinked. Agency, we feel the agency that there needs to be change. But also we feel the agency that there must be building of the necessary capability so that that change is quantitative. Change by itself it, it, it can be of any nature. I mean, like in Guinea, there has been change. <laughs> I don't know whether it is qualitative or not. I, I, I don't know. By the history of this continent. Let, let me first divert a bit. 
look at China, look at uh, Singapore, look at uh, Malaysia, look at South Korea. They build the uh, current uh, economic foundation that they have, which are robust. They want, they want uh, democracies in the Western sense of uh, democracy as it's prescribed. Singapore was uh, an authoritarian uh, country, really. But they radically changed the economic environment and their people are able to access, you know, a good life. They are, they are, they are, Per capita income, as we speak, is about $45,960. Malaysia by now should reach about 30,000. South Korea should be about uh, 25,000. Oh, no, no, Malaysia is around, should be about uh, 10,000. The last time I said it was 9,000. South Korea should be about 25,000, uh, their uh, per capita income. You can, you may recall that uh, at the time of independence in East Africa, we are all, all of the same uh, state, I mean, the same state in terms of, uh, of uh, per capita income at around the $300. Imagine where they are rich, or in Uganda were around 1,000 now. But remember that we have had one party state. Remember that we have had military regime. Remember that we have had autocrats. So the question is, why were they not able, even when they suppressed all political rights, to be able to channel research effort, resources, and thought into the economic development process. Because in the Eastern part, like uh, Singapore, is now open, becoming openly democratic. S South Korea is more advanced even in being democratic. But remember when they built the foundation for economic development, they were not. Here, we never built our economies, nor have we opened space politically. So we are a mixed up lot of people who went to educational institutions but left, never learned anything. Because we are driven by greed. Anybody who is driven, driven by greed basically shows you that they have not evolved beyond the level of, of emotional uh, being within them. Because the human being is made up of emotion, but there's also reason. So when people who are driven by rigid, uh, emotion, you know that they are not looking at anything else other than self survival that's why we still are. So we need to know that as a fact. There are many Ugandans who have evolved beyond that. Unfortunately, many of them don't want to join politics. They are sitting on the sidelines. They are hoping something can happen. Yes, something can happen, but it may not necessarily be quantitative. That's the reality of the matter. That's what we need to do. And that's why in Alliance for National Transformation, we keep cleaning both. And yes, change is necessary, but it needs to be quantitative change. The change which uh, enables the country to break out of the vicious cycle. Nine groups so far that we've had in power, but one of them moving in the same direction. So we're hoping that there can be one group and we hope and believe that it will be anything by God's grace that keeps on talking about values and ideas over and over until Ugandans who subscribe to that can come together and build a quick mass and we influence the direction of politics and uh, economic development in this country. Yes, thank you, Jano. Uh, now I'm going to ask you the second question from uh, Dr. Goroba Mutebi. And uh, it is about um, the movement system. That uh, is there a case for arguing that the movement should have been preserved for a bit longer? <laughs> the, the movement was the movement not supposed to be a permanent state. 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 So, but there was a lot of argument. In, but there was a lot of argument in the. Uh, there are those who just said that should be preserved. Many of us who believe that we should, believe that we should, it, should it, it was an evolutionary situation, and that the time that uh, the movement would be in place would uh, be spent in preparing ground for the evolution into a multi-party system of governance. That is one best case scenario would be that, that eventually when parties grow, that they grow in an environment where the majority of the political actors and the consciousness of the population is high, that they will be able to sustain democracy. That's the best case option. 
The other middle uh, range question was that even if the movement were to become dictatorial, that it concentrates on the building of the economy, that there would be discipline, that there would be zero tolerance corruption. This is Singaporean way. So that if you are to argue, follow the argument that says, there's someone who wrote, I don't even remember the, the author of the book, most, I believe uh, Gorova being while the red would not, who said that uh, you can uh, countries which are below a certain uh, per capita income, I don't remember what per capita income talks about, 5,000 or 6,000, that they can never be democratic. I don't fully subscribe to that. I think if you build a critical number of uh, leaders within the political area who are able, one, to work together in concert and over a period of time, transferring the same uh, belief, belief and character conviction to the second generation, that you can manage democracy even when you have not risen to those uh, levels of uh, per capita income. But even if that was correct, even that was lost. So the movement, as it is, it tried to masquerade as a system, but just simply became a party. And fortunately enough, it is going to end with the exit of Genome 7. Because it is unsustainable, it can't survive. It's built around an individual. Okay, thank you, thank you, General. Um, the next uh, couple of questions are about uh, the performance of the Alliance for National Transformation in the in the recently concluded elections. And I'll begin with one which is from um, Brian Nakankwasa. And he asks uh, what next after the elections and after the devastating loss and uh, the fact that uh, no even parliamentary candidate of the ANT won the elections. What do you think was the problem and how prepared are you to defend uh, the, the, the votes of your MPs and, 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 and your party? Yes, uh, Mr. Kwasa, thank you for the question, but I would like to request that uh, we uh, adjust the words used. Yes, we lost, but it was not devastating. <laughs> if it was a devastating loss, we would have just gone on the ground and started crying your hands out. We are just simply giving up. But, but let me give you an example. By April, and the, the elections ended in the in fair, we, as Alliance for Natural Transformation, started organizing conferences all over the country. And we met all our 740 candidates in 21 sub-regions. <laughs> the team of leaders that is devastated can't do that. <laughs> Hardly within a month, met with them, picked their thoughts, also uh, made them uh, know where we stood. We did analysis of the causes of our losses at the different places. But one heartening thing was that we all reached the conclusion, 90% plus of all actors were in those meetings, that in spite of the loss, as they say, there's a silver line, in every dark crowd has a silver line. We always see the silver line. And we decided that we now have to use these uh, four years to build our capabilities. Because those recognize that we're not that well prepared. We are hardly a year and a half when we engage in those elections. We also understood the opportunity that in, in, in this election enables us to have a platform to disseminate our, our message. And, and, and we know for sure, because the experience, we, we know this from experience, there's no part of the country where we went and faced rejection or hostility. Every part of the country went to, or they appreciated our message, but they would tell us that you have the right message, but you are weak. <laughs> Say we don't have the numbers. We are ready, we, we are we are able to live with that because we know the problem is not with ourselves. The problem is with the people who are saying that because they seem not to understand that strength comes from them, not from anywhere else. Wherever they choose put strength, that's why it will go. So we keep on disseminating this message until people understand and until we 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 build trust with the population. We are people who build short, medium, and long term. We are not uh, for quick uh, fixes. But even if anything happened, you know, suddenly, spontaneously, we also are people who are always prepared to, to take, in, take care of any situation that would uh, arise. So the information we picked, 
Just uh, five days ago, we went into a strategy meeting where we put into consideration all what we picked feedback from all the candidates and the coordinators. And we are going to start rolling out in terms of different strategies, in terms of, of, of the building, in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of branding, in terms of communication, in terms of fundraising. So we're a party that has been busy ever since the uh, election. If, if it wasn't for COVID, we would already have rolled out. Okay, so General, uh, let me ask a question that other people might be asking themselves, or if there are those that have not reached out to me yet. When, when you I, say- I ask this question, let me give you, uh, sorry, 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 Agatha. Okay, no, it's okay. One thing the public seems not to know, <laughs> and we ourselves would never have known until we participated in this election, was, was uh, small in numbers as well, because we have only four members of parliament, when we found out that the regime had targeted literally every potential winner, any candidate who would win to go to parliament, that they put specific attention to eliminate them, which happened in Ginja, in Arua, in, in, in Tulamo, in Serene, in a place like uh, even new entrance. One example I can give is a lady called Gloria in Madioko, who literally had already taken that state. That means that the uh, constituents. And, and then they had to go and, uh, and buy out uh, uh, the proposal and the second to, 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 to write a report to the electoral commission that their signatures had been forged. The, 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 the weakness of the electoral commission itself is the manner in how they handled such cases all over. And there are a number of them because of them I cannot give them. The intention of the regime was to say, let ANT not even have one member of parliament because we must extinguish them in the minds of the Ghana people, for the Ghana people to think that this party is going nowhere. It couldn't even get one member of parliament. Yeah, they, they did what they did. We are not people who get frustrated. We are still organizing because we believe in time. And one thing we know for sure that our day follows night, that the ANT at some point will take power in this country. Whatever is driving those, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have to change the word. I was going to use the, uh, those uh, great driven individuals that whatever they thought they achieved, they are living in illusion. There's going to be a point when they recognize and they realize that right is mine. So there are going to be people who may not know that. Some of them may hear it, they may believe it, they may not believe it. We are not uh, so bothered by that. As long as we keep focus on the things that we are doing, history is on our side. Time is on our side. And we will triumph. <laughs> Oh, that, that's um, reassuring, General. The questions, I had two questions as follow-up from, from your response just now. And the first one is where you talked about um, not being prepared because there wasn't enough time. But I, a person would ask you of what about uh, NUP, for example, which came much later than ANT and performed uh, tremendously well in the elections. Uh, what is, is there an explanation for that discrepancy between the time one party was around before the elections and the results? Well, the dynamics of the situation created uh, a web on, on which Nupu was able to write, and it was good for them because they eventually got 60 something members of parliament. I have ever lived such an experience because in, uh, I think, uh, 2006, we also rode on a web as, as, as FDC and we're just about a year and a half. The, the rest is history. So we've not had a web yet, but uh, whether a web comes or not, we keep getting organized. Because the issue for us is not the entry to power, the issue is taking power and using it for the purposes for which it is meant to be used having justice, having democracy, having transparency, having uh, efficient delivery of services. We keep working on that. The web may come, it may not come, that's not the issue. As long as we build and, and people start trusting us, then they will give us the necessary support. 
So we will not keep there hoping that there's going to be a wave. No, you cannot depend on waves because even waves, to, to, when, when a wave carries you, to sustain your presence where it has taken you, you must also organize. Because if you don't organize, you can easily, easily ebb with the water when it's going back into the ocean. So, so General, thank you for that response. Um, I said I'd pick two questions from your earlier response. And the mm -hmm. second one is where you said that uh, that the ANT was well received yeah, yeah. everywhere you went and people would say you have a good message, but, um, and that's the next question. I have someone here on Twitter who, who said earlier, responding to your tweet, that we need to start telling lies. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. Mm. Uh, that we need to start telling lies. That's why people are not listening. And I had in an earlier conversation on, on, on a WhatsApp platform, People said the same thing that uh, General Muntu is not for the Uganda of now. Ugandans, um, I don't know what, what he meant was that Uganda is not ready for you. And he was asking, what do you say to, to a question or, or a statement <laughs> like that? We, we, we have heard many people telling us that. But, but the main question we, we ourselves, what, what guides us, what leaders us in doing the number of things that we try to do. What we keep working on there, like if they trust from the population, and because we know that is the, where the best strength comes from, that the people trust us that we can manage power, and they have also trust us that once we are well organized, because once people trust you, they give you resources to keep on organizing, they give you political support, and that gives you the strength to remove the regime and also to manage power better. That's what we focus. On. So if you look at the short-term gains. And you compromise on the ideas and the principles and the values that you stand for for short term gains. And you start like, <laughs> if, you, if you tell one like two, three lies, people are not asleep, they will see through you, they know you are a liar. So on the, at the same time, how can you be seen as a liar and be trusted at the same time? We are not in politics for short term gains. We are in politics for uh, the, the long haul. We want to transform our country. And I'm taking power is one thing that many groups that have taken power, they have failed to change this country. We don't want to fall into that category. Um, thank you, General. Um, I'm going to allow uh, a few people that I've seen requesting to speak to ask you a question on the spaces. And uh, I'm going to ask, uh, let me get in touch with uh, Cynthia or Stephen, whoever is on Facebook, to send us. Uh, the questions that are coming in on Facebook. But for now, let me uh, accept the request of Martin, Martin Chintu to, to ask his question. Um, I, I don't know why I cannot get a hold of Martin, but there's uh, there are some other requests that I could um, Martin. Let me let me accept uh, Adams Adams Mukupe Adams. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think I think I'm going to continue and uh, and okay. let them send the the questions on uh, in the message because we don't we 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 seem to be failing to connect to them. So I'm going to request uh, whoever wants to ask any question to send it to me on uh, or 
DM or WhatsApp for those who access my WhatsApp. But uh, let us continue with the conversation now. And uh, the, the, the next issue I wanted us to address generally is about um, the, the status of women in this country, especially uh, the COVID-19 effects that we're talking about that so market women stay in the markets in very deplorable uh, conditions. We saw the hygiene, we saw, and, and those things um, continue to happen. And we live in a country where the government came singing about empowering women and, 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 uh, and all those things, which have not re been reflected in the lives of women lives of women have not yet changed in terms of uh, issues that are affecting them. What would you say about the, the, the state of, of women and women empowerment in this country? Well, um, uh, one thing you would have to give uh, General Seven and this regime is the extent to which they have manipulated the, the, the minds of uh, men and women, making it seem as if uh, they are the ones who have caused their advancement. Oh. Make them seem as if they have empowered them. But, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, we are uh, having tokens, like having a vice oh, president, like having a prime well, minister. The majority of the women are as uh, dire straits as the rest of society, uh, and even, even their own freedoms. I mean, for example, today, there was supposed to be a conference in Makerere. Organized by a young lady, a vice president, and they have they had fortunately invited for for political parties, including the movement. I think the movement was supposed to be uh, represented by Honorable Kadaga and and uh, a number of other parties. They, they just stopped that uh, conference from taking place, and and the 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 topic of the conference was. Uh, how to break barriers for women. <laughs> when they don't allow space for, for those kinds of conversations to take place, because what empowers any human being first is at the level of consciousness. That's, what, that's the most powerful uh, tool, instrument of, of ensuring that people, one, understand that they are equal, one, equal before God, equal before the law, equal before any other human being that exists that we have got the same capabilities, that you can do literally anything that you put your mind to. That's the first step, that's where you start from. It's not the position that people hold because you can have many people in, a, I mean, look for example, the representation of women in parliament. There's a solid group of women that if they were well empowered at the consciousness level, they could have become an effective tool to influence maybe the men who are sleeping in that parliament and move the country in, in the right direction. But the women were as asleep, those in the movement, as, as, the, as the men, you know? But they have the numbers. And the women have got 52% of the population. Fortunately, for some strange reason, I don't know whether it's cultural, I don't know what it is, women tend to be more honest, more transparent than the men in quite a widespread number of, of society. In, 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 in Uganda, even that has been so undermined. So look at that conference like in Makere, which has been so, where all uh, kinds of conversations are being held in to take stock of where the Ugandan women are, to see what challenges are, to make steps forward. And they just go and clamp down on that, uh, on that conference by, by the security forces. And the movement itself was represented. This regime is not good almost for anything. The best thing that can happen for this country is the termination of this regime. But beyond the exit of the regime, beyond its end, because that one is inevitable, that will happen for sure. What is not for sure, as I keep saying, is whether the next dispensation will be better. And for the next political dispensation to be better, it must be well prepared for. It must be consciously and, and in a disciplined, purposeful way, built for. It won't happen by accident. That's why the number of elite, those who really want to see this country better, need to engage in politics, either direct or indirect, through different uh, fronts. 
to influence the nature of politics in our country. I, I really cannot understand how we as a people, the majority of us, have been absorbed more in, in the issues of, 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 of physical existence than in the, in, the, in, the, in the things that you can't touch. You can't touch justice, you can't touch freedom, you can't touch fairness. But they are so critical in as far as I'm concerned to the well-being of a human being. To the extent that even if you have money, if you don't have freedom, you have no justice, there's no fairness. If you are going to be licking the boots of someone you are paying, you are not living a full life. You are not whole as a human being. Uh, thank you, Jano. Um, I'm going to go back to the questions that are coming in from the people that are following us now. And I have a question from Aaron Kaviri Ateni, and uh, his is on the Bijambia in Masaka. He says, uh, General Muntu said that apportioning blame to the opposition by government is uh, scapegoatism. But there are books authored by your colleagues about the Bush war that show the fact that opposition can use these kinds of tricks to cause unrest in the population to bring down the government in power. How can we be convinced that today's opposition cannot use the same tricks that were used by the NRA to bring down the government? What he's saying is that it was not so far-fetched that the opposition could do that. So what, what, what is your response, Jim? One, to me, we could argue that until the cows come home and maybe none would win the argument. The ultimate thing is, as I've already indicated, invest in the investigative uh, uh, arms of state so that whether opposition is involved or not involved, that there is a credible investigative uh, effort which brings out who the criminals are, if they are on their own, or if there's anybody behind them. If the person behind them is in the government or is in the opposition, because a politician can do many things, even those in government, who knows, you know? So the question at the end of it all is not who is behind it. The question is, have you carried out credible investigation? Have you fully found out who the uh, criminals are and, and there's evidence and they can be tried in the courts of law and they can be uh, well charged and tried and, and, and found guilty and sentenced? That's what we are simply asking for. That's why any society that wants to live in uh, freedom and, and in an environment where they have uh, uh, peace and they can enjoy stability. That's, what they, that's why the investment needs to be put. Thank you, Jano. Um, I have another question here that uh, is very interesting. Uh, someone called Golden Wu is asking what ANT's plan on the politics of populism. Because it oh. looks like very few on the politics of populism. He says very few Ugandans, very few Ugandans follow ideology. Guys. So so the, the golden rule is saying very few Ugandans follow ideology and manifesto. What is the MP's plan on the politics of populism? And what's the plan on the regional and district centers ahead of the next competitive elections? Yeah, we're building an infrastructure to operate at all levels, the district as well as the, the districts, the sub-counties, the constituencies, and the, uh, the sub-counties and the parishes. So that's a uh, plan in the office. But uh, yeah, politics of populism, we, we have chosen not to go that route. And in certain situations, it works. You can whip up sentiment. You can tell lies. You can tell people you build a bridge even where there's no river. And when they ask you, as I've seen in some novels, you say, okay, we'll create a river. And they say there's no river. You know, the human beings can be manipulated. You can promise heaven and earth. But, but the question is, who are you? What do you stand for? What do you represent? To, to, to us, that's the beginning of politics. That must be the foundation and the best so we build the party. So that we keep on explaining ourselves until people believe in us. And when we take power that we are able therefore to give what we have, you can't give what you don't have. Because if you are moved into populist politics, 
because you want to manipulate the public mind. That means you are engaged in literary deception. If you are deceptive in your manner, <laughs> even when you are in power, I'm telling you, you'll be deceptive. You know? Because the actions are guided by, by thoughts. So when you see people engaged in any action, you know that that's what is in their mind, whatever else they may tell you. Okay. That's, a, that, 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 that's the reality of the matter. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, unfortunately, our time is uh, fast spent, but I can ask two more questions that have come in, and then and then we we'll conclude. There's a question here. I don't know where it came from. It was just forwarded to me, and the person is asking: um, After election, CNT is hardly visible. Can't you be issuing alternative course of action in a timely manner? I understand we are in a pandemic, but it's like we went to bed after the elections. No, we actually didn't go to bed. I, I mean, we've been having a conference, I mean, a Zoom, Zoom meeting throughout since the lockdown. We've never stopped in planning on strategies as I've already indicated. We had, we had 21 conferences all over the country immediately after elections. Okay, they were not covered in the press because there, there's also, there also been attempts from certain quarters to have a, a, at some point during elections, have a press blackout almost on ANT and some other forces. We don't matter about that. The, the, the argument why it is important for us to become visible and we're also working on that. That's why in the strategy meetings we've been holding, we've been having a, a, so we developed a strategy on branding, a strategy on communication, and a strategy on creating more and more visibility, which we will be doing. But at the same time, we are people who want to, even when we are visible, to be doing things which are also uh, of value. <laughs> we don't just want to be seen. <laughs> Being seen alone may not necessarily be the solution. I mean, I know if, if it was a question of visibility, I know people who have been seen more than uh, maybe one million times. But if you, are, if you are seen, but you have not built something of value, you may not really go far. So we want to do both. And, and we've been uh, heightening our presence in different uh, social media uh, programs and TVs and radios by many ANT actors. It's, it's a building process. We are steadily moving on the path which we believe is the correct path, which we believe the right path. We have the resilience, we have the determination, we have the focus, the levels of consciousness to enable us to remain standing, even if we may seem to be a few, because we know everything has a turning point. So if you stick to what you believe in, eventually that turning point will turn into your favor. That's what we believe in, and that's why we are not uh, destabilized by some of the circumstances that uh, are within our political environment right now. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, thank you, um, I have one last question. And it is about the opposition parties coming, coming together. And the person asks, is it true that the opposition parties in Uganda cannot fully join forces due to the fact that they don't have the same vision? Unfortunately, I cannot turn on lights where I am. We are shut off. <laughs> so let me try and look for a little bit more light. No, but we, can, but we okay. can still see you. It is okay. okay. We are under shedding this morning. Um, Lord Shedding. Oh, sorry about that. Yep. Um, Did you hear the question? Uh, repeat it again. Repeat uh, the, it. The person says, it, is it true that the opposition party... Oh, the opposition party? unity. Yes. So we look at the unity from two different perspectives. There are those who believe that unity must be physical, that all of you must come together and operate under one organization or one name or something like that. Our thinking in ANT is that actually you can uh, operate uh, under unity of purpose. And, 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 and one that each, each we, we believe so much in organization. And now, now that we've just come out of an election, our own thinking, I don't know what other parties are doing, but at least what we've been doing ourselves is through self-reflection understand uh, what happened during the electoral process, while we may not have performed as well as uh, we expected. And also to start uh, building on the strength that we have, focusing on how to overcome the weaknesses that there are, 
doing a number of things that I've already indicated, doing fundraising, brand building, and all that, so that we build the necessary capability. Because even in unity, you need to, to, to be effective, you need to unify strength. Because if you come and you're not, all of you are not that well organized, you cannot create the strength out of, of, of weakness. So we, we are always open. We have always participated in the co cooperation uh, uh, efforts. But every time we are going to cooperate, we first do analysis to find whether we are going to add value at that point in time. And when we think we will add value at that point in time, we join. If we think it needs a bit of delay, so that we work on other things and we put our own views across on what we think others should be doing in the meantime before we come to full unity, we also advise. We are not people who are deceptive. We only do what we tell you. Anything we tell you is what we do. If we are not uh, yet convinced about doing something at any particular given time, we don't deceive. We tell you for this time, we may not be able to join you, but keep sharing information with us as we do whatever else we think would be necessary to do before we join that effort. So we are open-minded. Okay, so uh, I'll be asking one last question. It came a while back from Patrick Pongolove, and uh, he asks, uh, how can ANG develop alternative policy direction for the country that are founded in research, technical depth, and operational excellence? Well, I've been working on that. We had a conference uh, last month on uh, taxation, and we intend to do that on a monthly level consistently over the different uh, uh, policy areas that need to be tackled. This month, we're going to have a second one and we'll be having one every month, after which we cut out uh, in-house discussions. And then we will end up uh, uh, producing the policy positions in the written uh, um, documents, and then we will be able to, to disseminate them to the public. Thank you very much, uh, General. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if if there's anything you want to say in um, as part of your concluding remarks, and we end here. Yes, so I think if ask, there's anything you just want to tell the country as we conclude. To ask uh, the the people who are on this line and those that they are able to influence in their spheres of influence, we really must not accept to bow to fear. Fear is the worst form that the enemy uses to, to make people remain enslaved. So we must do everything humanly possible to ensure that one, we don't lose hope, we don't bow to fear, and we keep organizing for our rights and freedoms. And, 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 and to change the political environment in this country, to change the political culture in this country. We are well endowed as a country. The problem, as many politicians have said before, that we have to continue to say that we are well endowed in terms of uh, water availability, in terms of rich soil, in terms of, as it is called, the power of Africa. But it's, it has, up this point in time, stopped on what? The biggest problem is the implementation. And therefore, that's why we need Ugandans who, want, who are value driven, who, who, whose politics value best, that we join hands and we we'll see how we can do what has eluded. Almost all politicians since independence, so we can see how it is effective. And we thank you. Thank you, Agatha, for hosting me. Thank you for the uh, Ugandan citizens who have been here you know, locally and those abroad in the diaspora for, for spending your time, sacrificing your time to engage in this conversation. May God bless you all. Thank you very much, everyone. For tuning in. Thank you, General, for your time and for those responses. I would like to um, end here, but we will have these conversations next month, the second week of October. So we have uh, monthly conversations where General Montu on behalf of ANT talks about topical issues in the country and, and the alternative um, positions that uh, the ANT would, uh, would offer. We thank you very much for being with us and please have a good evening. Thank you, General. Thank you. Welcome. God bless.